hi folks and welcome to this edition of Tech Talk here on the Cisco Support Committee. Our topic for discussion today is enhancements in EIGRP. Interesting? Right. So as we know, it's one of the most widely deployed protocols for enterprise networks. We'll discuss the new features that have been introduced in EIGRP recently and how they can benefit the enterprise level customers to achieve metric parity, faster convergence and optimal routing. In the past couple of years, there have been several new developments in EIGRP and we have picked up few key features that will make life easier for you. In this edition of Tech Talk, we will discuss about Cisco opening up EIGRP as an internet draft, metric parity above 10 gig links, few new features which can be deployed in DMVPN and Layer 3 MPLS environment. To talk more on the same, our experts joining me today, Pavan Gupta and Rahul Kukreja, both are customer support engineers with the Cisco TAC routing protocol team here at Cisco Bangalore. They have wide experience in the routing domain and have been actively handling TAC cases for EIGRP protocol for Cisco's premium customer base. Welcome to the Tech Talk guys. Thanks Satish. It's a pleasure to be here on the Tech Talk. Thanks Satish. It's uh, glad to be here on Tech Talk with you. Great. So guys, I've heard uh, Cisco open up EIGRP some time back. So why exactly Cisco did that? And what's the internet draft all about? That's a good question, Satish. Let me take this up. So the main idea behind opening up EIGRP is to grow the protocol further. Like almost every other day, I come across customers where they are running this huge deployment of full of Cisco devices. But there would be this one network device somewhere in between, which is a third party device, which is a non-Cisco device. And it mm -hmm. cannot run EIGRP. Now, because of this, even though our customers want to use EIGRP, they're not able to do so because that device doesn't support EIGRP. So that's why Cisco opened up EIGRP so that they can run EIGRP irrespective of the multi-vendor deployment in the network. To talk about uh, the internet draft, it's nothing but a working document of IETF that has a validity period of six months and it can be updated or replaced at any point of time. If we talk specifically about EIGRP, the EIGRP internet draft talks about the how EIGRP works, the convergence mechanism, how it uses dual to find the best path and the EIGRP terminology. Our users can take a look at the slide deck and use the links in the slide deck to check out the internet draft and the FAQ page. I'm sure it would be very useful to them. Right, thanks. So I've heard the development regarding some something called uh, wide metric in EIGRP. Can you explain a bit more on that? Yeah, that's a good question, Satish. Uh, let me take this one. Mm -hmm. So before we talk about wide metric, uh, let's take an overview of uh, what the legacy metric is and what was its limitation plus why the wide metric was being invented. So let's take an example uh, which is in the slide. So we have an interface over here which is a constant delay and if we see that if we change the bandwidth of an interface to more than 10 gig values then the EIGRP metric remains same. So now with the adoption of uh, high speed links customers have started deploying uh, interfaces with more than 10 gig uh, values to get more throughput. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case then with legacy metric we have this limitation. So we have wide metric to overcome this limitation. Now let's talk about few key basic differences which are there with wide metric and legacy metric. So wide metric supports 64 uh, bit metric calculation whereas uh, legacy used to sub legacy supports uh, only 32 bit metric calculation. Now as the metric value is of 64 bits but the routing table uh, variable is only of 32 bits. So there is also a concept of rib scaling factor which is used to fit that 64 bit EIGRP metric into 32 bit routing table metric. The other difference which I could think of uh, is, is, is more on the representation terms. So in wide metric delay is, in, delay is represented in picoseconds whereas uh, in classic metric it is in microseconds. If you talk about metric calculation there are a group of uh, constant variables which are used along with uh, interface delay and bandwidth in wide metric whereas in classic metric it was only interface bandwidth and delay. Now uh, if you talk about uh, more on uh, how wide metric devices could be deployed in the network so they are very it is pretty easy plus backward compatible to deploy the wide metric devices in the setup which is already running legacy metric devices. The only other consideration is wide metric sub, uh, is supported in the EIGRP name mode. So this new 64 bit metric is supported only with the EIGRP name mode. Now let's refer back to the slide and see that and as we could see now with the interface bandwidth values of uh, more than 10 gig 
there is a unique metric value for EIGRP which was not the case with the legacy metric. So this is how wide metric could uh, uh, overcome the limitation of the legacy metric. Mm -hmm. So how can our customers check whether uh, wide metric is supported in their mm -hmm. iOS or not? Yeah, that, that's a, a relevant question. Mm -hmm. So customers could either use Cisco feature navigator and find out if that feature is supported in the iOS release which they are running or not, uh, which they are running. Mm -hmm. Or what they could do is that they could use command line as well and check the output of show EIGRP plugins and find out the release which is in the first line of the output for EIGRP. So if they are running release 8 or higher then it supports wide metric. So you mentioned that wide metric can only be used with the EIGRP yes. name mode. Mm -hmm. So what is the name mode and what are its benefits? That is a good catch Satish. Mm -hmm. so yeah EIGRP wide metric can only be used with the name mode. And name mode is nothing but another way of configuring EIGRP where you can just configure one single instance of EIGRP and refer it by any name that you want. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you can configure multiple autonomous systems within the same EIGRP instance. The benefit is now all the commands of EIGRP are grouped at the same place. In case of legacy metric we had to use in different different commands. The EIGRP commands were kind of scattered all over the place. We had to use interface level commands, we had to use writer, router level commands. But now in case of uh, wide, in case of name mode everything is grouped under the same place. Mm -hmm. So if we take an example of EIGRP authentication for example. So in case of the legacy one EIGRP commands authentication command need to be configured on the interface level. So you will need to configure one command at every interface that needs to take part into EIGRP. But that is not the case in the name mode. In the name mode we can just configure one single command under the address family mode and all the uh, interfaces that are part of that address family will start running EIGRP with authentication enabled on them. Mm -hmm. There are various other features as well like uh, the EIGRP timers like the BFD configuration which has again been moved from the interface level to the router level. And if you talk about something new then there is this feature called as the EIGRP metric for summary routes. In case of uh, old one the summary route uh, the metric for the summary route needs to be calculated by the metric of the best component route. Now in case that best component route goes away that metric needs to be recalculated and so it will cause reconvergence. But in case of uh, name mode we do not have that. We can specify a static metric value for the summary route. So there will be no reconvergence or no recalculation. Apart from wide metric there are various other features as well which are supported only in the name mode like the EIGRP route tag enhancements like the EIGRP fast reroute, like the EIGRP over the top or uh, IPv6 VRF Lite. These are various few new features that have been introduced recently and they are supported only in the name mode. We will discuss some of these features later today. Mm -hmm. So since most of our customers have been using EIGRP in classic mode mm -hmm. and uh, they will need to migrate to name mode right. So how easy is to migrate from Cisco classic mode to name mode? That is a valid question. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you it does not get any easier than this. Mm -hmm. It is like there is just one single command and it is like one moment you are running the classic mode you type just one single command and boom you are onto the name mode. Okay. Yeah. And all the commands from the interface level are automatically moved to their equivalent commands at the router level. And mm -hmm. all that with zero downtime. Think about it. It does not get any better. Okay. Right. So I mean really impressive you know talking about the, the functionality. Let us talk about some of these new features as you have mentioned and I am sure your customers might be really eager to know more about it. So which mm -hmm. one you want to go first? Sure Satish, so let us talk a bit about uh, a common kind of setup which is being which, which we see frequently these days while working with the customers mm -hmm. and then we will talk about a feature which could be used in that setup. So it is it's more of a hub and a spoke kind of topology. Right. Let us see an example, so we in this example as our viewers could see that we have a uh, a network which is a sing single DMVP in the cloud, mm -hmm. single DMVP in hub cloud and which there are two spoke sites, spoke 1 and spoke 2. Okay. So spoke 1 in this setup mm -hmm. has two routers R2 and R3 which are advertising the same subnet 172.16.1.0 slash 24 to the hub router which is R1 mm -hmm. and spoke 2 site has one router which is R4 at the extreme right receives all the routes from the hub router. Now let us take a look at how the control plane uh, route exchange happens in this setup. So if the metric of the route on a spoke 1 router is the same then they will advertise that route with the same metric to the hub and hub will install both the routes in the routing table. But when hub advertises the same route back to other spokes like in this case spoke 2 router R4 it will only advertise one route. So when R4 receives this route 
it can be either of uh, with the next stop of R2 or R3. So, although we have two possible paths from spoke 2 to spoke 1 from R4 to R2 and from R4 to R3, but we will be able to utilize only one route, one path. So, to avoid this or to make this uh, achieve uh, in, a, in a pretty straightforward way, mm -hmm. uh, th uh, this is the new feature which was being developed recently which is EIGRP add path feature. Okay. With this feature what hub could do is if we just configure a single command which is add path 2, hub could advertise multiple next stops in the EIGRP update packet. Mm -hmm. And once we have multiple next stops the other spokes in this case R4 will also install two routes in the routing table. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case then we can easily achieve uh, load sharing over the spoke to spoke tunnels from uh, spoke 2 side to spoke 1 side. Mm -hmm. Prior to this feature it was not that uh, it was it was it was right. we are not able to achieve this in, in a straightforward way, mm -hmm. but with this feature we are able to achieve this. Right, right. I think that is really impressive yeah. um, talking about these features. So, uh, but traditionally EIGRP mm -hmm. has been contained within uh, the domain right. And, um, now with more and more customers deploying large scale private networks and uh, you know spanning multiple sites using MPLS. So I hear that EIGRP has a lot of uh, you know tricks up uh, you know in its sleeves. So uh, can you share more on that? Sure Satish, we do have something for our customers who use uh, L3 MPLS or uh, public WAN connection to connect mm -hmm. remote sites. So uh, we have a feature called EIGRP over the top which can be used for this. Before that let's take about uh, let's talk about how we traditionally do that. Mm -hmm. If you talk about traditional way of doing it, we would need to run some kind of protocol between the provider edge and the customer edge devices. Mm -hmm. Now it can be done two ways. Either we use an IGP to do that like EIGRP or OFPF, in which case it becomes kind of uh, pretty transparent for the customer because you are running using the same protocol, but then provider has to do uh, load uh, provider has to do redistribution on their device on the PE device. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you can do you can use BGP as that PE to CE protocol, but in that case, you as a customer would have to do that kind of redistribution on the customer edge device. So, either way, you would have to do that, or the only other way was to run a tunnel between the two do, between the two sites. Mm -hmm. But that is where EIGRP over the top feature comes to the rescue. You do not have to do either of that, and you do not even have to be dependent on the on the provider because now you can use EIGRP between your remote sites without having to do any kind of redistribution of your public networks into the provider network or and you and it is pretty easy to configure you do not have to configure any specific protocol and you are still utilizing the PE to CE connectivity. I think Rahul can add more to that. Sure Pavan, so let me talk a bit about uh, uh, from the architecture point of view how the OTP works. Let us talk about the control plane first, so at the control plane OTP uses EIGRP for the route exchange mm -hmm. and at the data plane it uses uh, LISP protocol, LISP encapsulation. So LISP is a locator ID separation protocol. It also uses a, a concept similar to a, uh, BGP route reflectors and uh, that, that is used to avoid full mesh of EIGRP neighbors. Let us take an example and try to understand this feature in a better way. Mm -hmm. So as you could see in the slide, it is an MPLS cloud which we have which has three sites deployed. The customer edge routers on those three sites are C1, C2 and C3. So in this case, uh, we assume that the, the C2 is the site which is acting um, as a route reflector. So all the other sites, it is C1 and C3, they will have a static neighborship with this specific router which is C2. And now if you look at how the route exchange will happen, how the EIGRP plays its role. So in this scenario, C3 router will advertise its LAN subnet to C2 router mm. and C2 without changing the next stop of that subnet will advertise the same subnet to other routers with which it has formed the neighbor. So in this case it will be C1 router. Now we have the routes on C1 with the next stop of C3's router which is uh, the, the MPLS IP address in this case of C3. Mm -hmm. Now when it comes to the data plane forwarding how the traffic is being forwarded, when C1 wants to, C1 wants to send the traffic to C3 it prepares the packet and over the packet it is the LISP encapsulation which is applied. And in the outer header of that LISP uh, encapsulated packet, the source and destination IP are of C1 and C3. So once this packet is being sent to P1, then P1 like based on the, the provider's routing it will send the traffic directly to P3 and then to the C3. Mm -hmm. So although 
C1 was receiving the routes via C2, but the traffic is still forwarded via the best way. And once the traffic reaches on C3, it gets decapsulated and then is sent to the dedicated LAN uh, subnet. So this is how, um, like, although the, it, the the solution is kind of a provider independent, and there is an end-to-end -end transparency in the solution. So this is how our customers can utilize this feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so guys, we all know that EIJRP is one of the fastest protocols. So, what are we doing to improve the convergence time? That's correct, Satish. EIJRP is actually one of the fastest protocols available right now. Mm -hmm. But one thing I always tell my customers is that a good network design is the key to faster convergence. Right. Okay. EIJRP being the fastest protocol, it uses the concept of feasible successors in order to achieve that fast convergence. But again, the presence of a feasible successor depends on the good network design. So, it's all kind of interrelated. Mm -hmm. But still, to improve that convergence time even further, we have a new feature called fast reroute for loop-free alternates. Now these loop-free alternates are nothing but the feasible successor. There's just new name for them. Okay. But again, what this, fast, what this fast reroute feature does is it puts that feasible successor information into the Ceph table. Mm -hmm. So in case the best route goes away, in case there is a link failure, that information can be used directly from the Ceph table. So it provides the convergence time of less than 10 milliseconds. Oh, okay. Right? Impressive. That's pretty impressive. And then again, you don't have to do it for your entire network. If you want, like if you have uh, some subnet which is carrying sensitive data like voice or video and you want to do it just for that subnet, in that case you can still do that using a route map. So users have flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Now we can take a look at the slides. We can see that the current output is, the without using this feature, the current output is the theft table only contains the, the successor information. But after we enable that feature, the Ceph table also has a repair path, which is nothing but the feasible successor information. Okay, okay. It's really exciting to see, you know, uh, some of these uh, new, uh, like, innovation happening mm -hmm. in the established concepts mm -hmm. like EIGRP. So, the question is, what more details? I mean, uh, you have talked a lot about this, but what more details can you share with us? Hmm, let me think. Okay, uh, let's talk about this new feature called route tag enhancements. Mm -hmm. Now, this feature allows us to filter the routes based on the tag value. You'd say that's already available in the market. It's been so many years we can do that using the route maps, mm -hmm. right? But now, what this feature gives us is it gives us the ability to assign, to declare, or to define the route tags in a de dotted decimal format, just like an IP address. Okay. The advantage is now you can use access list to filter those routes based on the IP address, right? B based on the dotted decimal format. We can even use a wildcard mask to allow or deny a set of tag values. I mean, think about the possibilities. It's all about being creative. Right, Rahul? That's right, Pawan. So, yeah, this feature is pretty cool. Our customers could use tags in IP address notation and then can use ACLs to filter or set the ta uh, ta tag values, which mm -hmm. makes life even more easier. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, as we all know, EIGRP has been there for past 15 years. Mm -hmm. right. But all these inventions which have uh, came across, uh, which we discussed today, have been developed in the past two or three years. Yeah. Right, so, right. looking at all these things, uh, I can see that uh, it's it's uh, it's an exciting time in the world of EIGRP. Yeah, one of the legacy protocol, you know, right. getting these enhancements right. recently. Exactly. So I think it, this will be really uh, interesting for all our users. You know, yeah, it's so going to be really exciting. Yeah. Right. So you're going to include a lot of details in your blog as well. Yeah, there'll be a lot more information in the blogs. Okay. Yeah. Great. So okay, so that concludes our today's session. So thanks a lot. I think you, are, you guys have included a lot of details and it's, it's a perfect uh, presentation. So thanks a lot, uh, Pavan. Thanks a lot, Rahul, for thanks sharing your expertise thanks with us. Okay, great. So hope this tech talk on enhancement on EIGRP was useful to you and we look forward to your feedback. You can send in your feedback via the comment section of this blog or video. You can also collaborate via various social media channels like Facebook and Twitter. We hope you like it. Goodbye and thank you for watching.